My name is William M. Braddock, Jr. I was born in Marouche, Louisiana. Is there a legacy of service in your family? No. Are you the only person in your family that's been in the military? No, I, mean, I think a couple of my brothers joined for what they were drafted. Uh, no volunteers. I don't want to volunteer to go in. I went in 1940. When did you join the Marine Corps? Uh, I think 10, 14, uh, somewhere along there, uh, 1940. And what was your motivation for joining? Well, in high school, a lot of the younger kids were talking about it's going to be a war and we probably should get some training. A lot of them didn't have any training and being drafted. And I thought, well, if I go in earlier and get some training, then when they sent me overseas, I'll have some knowledge of what's going on instead of going in that green. And I think it paid off, because here I am. <laughs> so when you joined, where did they send you for training? Uh, I, I, I joined Marine Corps in uh, Monroe, Louisiana, and I was sworn in down in New Orleans. And they sent me to uh, uh, Diego, San Diego, California. About my second time being on a train. Tell us a little bit about your training experience. What was that like? Well, going through recruit training was real good. It's all new. I was about uh, fourth or fifth guy from the tail end. Called rest of much. You put in the car into height, and uh, only I don't. I say the first squad because I'm on the right hand side, so I, I wasn't in the center squad or the second or third. It's best being the first or the fourth or first and third, whichever. That way, uh, and again, it had a drawback because sometimes you got drill instructors and they just carrying them little sticks, you know, and. If you get out of step, you whop you at it. So if you only, yeah, if you hit a second or third squad inboard, they, they, they might uh, tap you on the shoulder. But them guys on the side, you know, pow. We had one guy in particular, uh, I think his name was Fontenot or something, something similar to that. He couldn't seem to stay in step to save his life, at least according to the drill instructor, because he was pounding on him all the time. So I took his attention off some of the rest of us. So after training, where did they send you? Uh, at the time, uh, we were sent up to Camp Ellet, which was a new military base for the Marines. First, they sent me to the tanks. I was in the tanks, but the tanks and I didn't seem to get along. At least the instructor didn't think so. So they sent me up to uh, I think they call it, my memory's not as good as it's a little foggy. Uh, Camp, uh, yeah, Camp Ellet, I believe that was the name of it. It was a new base being made uh, in the tent. It said, I believe six Marines, all our recruit training. And it's, it's, of course, this is before the war. And, uh, and if, you want, if you want to go to LA or uh, someplace, you go. When the instructor was not around, it was very unorganized. Some of them would leave on, say, Thursday and won't come back to Monday. So, and they never was missed. And of course, I didn't pull that stunt because I was afraid I might get caught being new. And when I got out of recruit training, they put me in tanks. And, and you know, the guy sits up here in this front of the tank and he controls you, and you down below running the tank, he had his feet on your foot, on your shoulders. He wants you to go left, he'll press your shoulders. You know, if he only wants you to turn right on the tank, he'll press his right foot press on your shoulder. That wasn't for me. I, sometime I, I go the wrong way. So the instructor didn't seem to think I suited. Being a farm boy, if I was riding a horse, it'd be different, but tank was all kind of different. I recruit training. Uh, in a camp there in California. 
I think I was there about maybe maybe a month, and they, they need to help a lot of guys and then uh, in Hawaii, and my name being Braddock, that's it, I'm at the top of the list, so they dressed about 10 of us. We put, put us aboard a ship, I've never been aboard a ship before. And you think you'd be level? No, go down, down, down. So that's the way we were when we got to Hawaii. But anyway, I learned down there, you don't get seasick too much, but it does get hot down there. That was my first experience being aboard a ship. Then on, I didn't want no more from the lower deck too far. And after I see it. Now, what were your duties? Guard duty. We was, uh, see, my first, my first duty was they had quarters on a base on $4, which is, which is within Pearl Harbor. Uh, a lot of officers mm -hmm. and, and NCO quarters, and that was my first post was walking. Four hour walk, four on and 16 off. Then after that, uh, as you <coughs> guys got promoted, sent back to the States or whatever it's going, <coughs> then we got equated up, you could stand the ferry, watch the ferry go back and forth to the main island, mainland. Yeah, you know, for where the gig boats come in with the officer officers that you had to enlist in the ramp and had a guard we had see we had three you know, three different one three different posts on four dollars and all of them were four hours each most of four hours and uh, 16 off prior to december 7th was there any feeling that the japanese may attack i think that was a room of it but nobody thought too much about it and I, I, I think another thing that came out, I think a lot of that, it's just a rumor. A lot of it, uh, say, I don't know whether it's Japanese or Filipinos or whatever. Anyway, they kind of took them off a of, uh, Fort Island, where I was, because that's where most of the planes were. And it, eventually, uh, yeah, I guess it, eventually they took us off of it, then. Uh, are we are we in when they when they, when they uh, got we got bombed? Anyway, when we got when they did bomb us, uh, I was being a guard duty there. We sent us to uh, end of the runway, and we dug a big old foxhole about uh, six or seven feet across, about three three about three feet deep, wide, and about yeah well. Well, anyway, the top of my head came to the surface if I stood up. And we had a little place where you had cots. And that was three on, I think six off or something like that. And that, that lasted about two weeks after the bomb Pearl Harbor. And then from that, we, we kind of went back to our regular duties. Took it off that we did have to stay down there in those holes. So take us back to December 7th, that day. How did your morning start off? That particular morning, we were, we were in the galley having breakfast that morning. And all at once, the civil war, we, uh, I forget the nickname. Anyway, they start salt shaking, all that stuff. If they start rattling around and and we said, well, another one of them pilots them cracked the plane up. We just wait for them to call us out because any time they have a crash up, they break out the Marines. And I was in the duty section, so I knew it. But we come to find out that that wasn't so. So yeah. then we ran out to the steps on the barracks, and I could look out across there and I could see the jet planes at about. Uh, maybe 100 feet up. And, and we, here we are standing on the Marine barracks on the steps, and the plane flying back this way, and they appeared to me. They were just looking at us, and just a grin like a possum meat and shit. They just flying, they went real fast. It was about, uh, uh, 
they probably about 100 feet off the, off the ground. They had to be high enough to the mass of the battleship, they wouldn't hit it. So, but they're flying right over the middle of the water. Yeah, was, I think there's about four planes within that formation. And, they, and as I said earlier, they had the shield back, looking at us like they just look me like they're just grinning at us. Well, you know, you're, you're kind of shell shocked, so to speak. You just don't. You just can't picture what's really going on. It, don't, it hadn't really hit you. At least it didn't me. But anyway, after after initial bombing, so it, it, then they broke us out. Told us to go get our weapons and and uh, couldn't find no ammunition. I think I got five rounds of ammunition. That's, that's all they had to give us, and set myself and three other Marines down to the seaplane ramp. And we were down there, and we could really see uh, how some of the personnel got hurt and bummed or torn up. Uh, they were sailors or Marines that was on board the ship. That when the ship was sinking or they was in the water, and I down the seaplane ramps, I said earlier, and you see them, they were trying to come ashore, when I help some of them get ashore, uh, you see some of them leg be just dangling or arm, you name it, it's all got which way it's guys. Uh, you see this guy got drowned, he couldn't swim or injured so from bumming of the ship. It wasn't a pretty picture at all. What's when the destroyer? One of the destroyers was trying to get out so it wouldn't get sunk. And at the seaplane ramp, the destroyer cut at only one inch away for the ships to come into Pearl Harbor. And I would own, that's four dollars in the center. And this ship would come this way, and they were, the jet planes were ready after trying to sink it in the harbor. But the captain had enough sense. The, the captain was now, he was, remember it's said Sunday morning, so most all the bosses were gone. They were all ashore. I was 11 of the 100, I'm pretty sure. That's where I would have been if I had been on duty. But anyway, uh, the destroyer, the uh, third guy, I think the paper said third guy in command, uh, one instance, he, 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 uh, he run, the, he run the destroyer into the bank, and also it couldn't be sunk in the harbor, which all the ships, the battleships in the harbor, couldn't get out. No ships could have, could have, could have gotten out. But he, that was a wise, very wise decision he made. And I could see all this going on where I was, because I was down at the seaplane ramp when the planes came in. But if you ever been on the entranceway is coming this way, Seaplane ramp was right here in front of it when you come on four dollar. And this is over on the right hand side because they went around this way. They made when the ships came in, they made the circle. And see I think it was, I think the California was tied up on this side. See I'm I'm looking out toward the ocean on the left hand side. But California I believe was right here. And I think the Oklahoma was down here. Anyway, the way they got sunk. The destroyers was on the on the other side. They're the one finally got out. But after they tried it, that the captain, uh, I think he was a, I think it was a chief. That all the all, all the officers was just been Sunday morning. All the wheels were gone. So those who had to do it, I'm sure it was one of the chiefs. He had sense enough to, to uh, beach the ship and also they wouldn't sink it in the middle of the harbor. And that was a very wise decision on his behalf. And I saw all this in view of me and where I was. I could, I could see everything going on, not knowing what was going on. Yeah, I was just a young private. Well, I said one thing, we didn't back down. Didn't tuck our tail and run. Even though we, some of us didn't have no ammunition, you could pretend you had some. 
which some of them did. Uh, we had some goofies, all right, privates. Where did you go from Pearl Harbor? Uh, after the war had started, and then any of us wanted to stay there because we knew all it actually was but then on the grass right off canal at the time, most for the Marine. So after about three months or two or three months, I finally got transferred off and back to the States. And I went into uh, it's, it's starting up the paratroopers in the Marine Corps, and that's what I put in for paratroopers. And from paratroopers, uh, I went to uh, from there, I went to Bougainville. Now, we're in Bougainville. Now, we, we didn't draw no fire. We went in for landing on Bougainville. I think there's, as I recall, the water wasn't very deep. We had to jump in about waist deep or almost neck deep to go away to shore on Bougainville. But no accident didn't seem, did not receive no fire at all. And the word was the Japs knew we were coming and they evacuated because they knew what happened to them on, on, on Grand Ole Canal. And it, there was a island shaped this like, so we, we went in here and out on the right hand side. A lot of, I tell you, a lot of broad patches. Got in the broad patch, and we call them wait a minute mines. You get hung up in those, you just could not go forward. You had to back out. So we said, hey, there's water, and so wait a minute vines up here, don't come through here. So, so I was on Bougainville, uh, maybe three or four weeks, out of a big, big foxhole, uh, down about uh, five feet in a way. Had my, had my cot down there. And piss call, Charlie would come over every night about nine, ten o'clock. Flying, he wouldn't be flying very, but be real slow. That's what we call him, piss call Charlie, trying to keep us awake at night. That went on for about three or four months, something like that, about weeks, whatnot. And then the word came out, they're looking for guys to join the paratroopers. They formed a paratroopers in the Marine Corps, and they were getting fifty dollars more a month. When they mentioned fifty dollars more a month, that caught my eye. So I put in for it, and that's how I left uh, Bougainville on a ship, headed back to the states, and went to the paratrooper school in Camp Gillespie there, at, uh, off from San Diego. And where did I go from there? Tell us. Tell us about your time on Iwo Jima. Oh, yeah, first wave Evo. It was, and when the Amtrak come in the first wave, they go out and they turn sideways. Now in order to get out of it, we had to go up, jump over the side, which is about six feet down there. And we got this pack on our back and our weapons and ammunition. You know, and the sand, it, it, it's just about like this, it's about eight, ten feet uh, farther. And you take one step, slide back once. Just bit there, just where it was. And bullets just flying out this way. Because the chaps, they, they, they didn't want us, they didn't want us to come ashore, that's for sure. A lot, I tell you, I think about 80 sentiment Marines got shot. Fortunate good Lord with him, with me, myself, and another guy, uh, uh, I didn't stand up and run. I was down like this, and I, and I, and, uh, I didn't have the rifle. I had what you call the uh, the carbine. It's a little small rifle, about like that. Weigh about four pounds, if if that much. And you had uh, about fifteen, see, about eight, ten rounds of ammunition. Look like look like twenty-two, um, a little bit larger than twenty-two. And then we asked what I had went ashore, and now would have to climb up this sand place all along the way, 
battleships, maybe. Shells, but the exploded place was kind of black with smoke from uh, ships shelling evil in, in front of us because we were coming. And, uh, and the planes came over, they did some more bombing. And as we, as we advanced, that's what, once we got up there, lean down low with your weapon, going through you, take your eyes, guys, you, you don't know whether they're dead or not. Many were just laying on the, on, on, on the coast of water. Our job was, tell us, cross the eye, cut the eye off, when once you get on the other side, uh, we're gonna spend the night over there, and then we turn left, go up, out to the we was right, right at the base. So we went across, and that night, a couple of guys, we, the next morning, we had to evacuate them because the sand was so hot, their back was nothing, just blistered. So they had to evacuate them, and as we, now we had a couple of guys that, uh, in fact, the gunny, he should have known better. He told them, don't go on fire, don't go in the dens. What had to he do that morning? Next morning, we were going to go up top side, up, upside. He goes in the key, he goes in and gets shot. So he had to be evacuated. That delayed us another half a day. But we finally went up next morning. We started again on the, on the opposite side, go up Mount Sabati, <clears throat> almost just about the surface. Uh, the pig old Japanese foxhole with a gun in it. Over here, laying a, laying a Jap. And the sun was shining out. It must be about 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'm coming up there with th three or four men with me. I just squatted the leader. And when I walked up, I took a look. I said, hey, that dude's alive. Bow, bow. The sun was shining. You could see his clothes going in and out. Now, if we had passed him up, he would have shot us. But being a Cajun like me and losing out on Gloria, I spotted his breathing, so. Anyway, we went on up on top of on Iwo Jima, and we met the, the other, I, I could look down to the, to the in center, I seen other guys coming up with the flag. Something happened along the way, got sh sh Anyway, they're drawing a lot of fire. They had to go back down, and we continued up, up on top of the island, and sent three out kind of off to the right, cause that a nice trail on the reverse side of Evil goes right down to the ocean. I needed to go down there, but it was a nice trail, like it. And later on, the guys, I saw the guys come off the ship. I didn't see them come off the ship, but I, I seen them come up. And uh, they were carrying the flag. Now, when they had the first flag they put up, it was a little, little fella. And they, they got, uh, as I understand it, the guys on the ships was really complaining. They said, we couldn't see it. That flag is too small. We can't see it. So they sent the guy, <coughs> they sent a larger flag in. And I was up there, well, I was up there when they put up both of them. We was protecting the top of the island then, because we already had to. Yeah, we spent the night up there. And then from there, we went up to the front lines. And I went down the left hand side of the island, my squad, and the gunny. And that's over here in the ocean. I, and we hunted nothing but bushes and briars, all that stuff on that left hand side. And guys who had the center part of the island, that, they were lucky because it was just clear. And and, uh, and the uh, airport was right in their field, see, so they had a lot of clear. But on our side, there was nothing but bushes, briars, and gutters. So we were, they, they were complaining. And on top of that, they ran into, one ran into mine for you. Thank God I wasn't with that crew, that squad, that ran into them, because three or four of them got wounded. I think some of them lost a leg. I didn't see them. I was more or less to the right, but I probably would have ran into them had I been up forward. 
I stayed on the left hand side. That's where was, I was until I think we spent 25, 26 days on there, moving slowly. Now, one other, another place I remember real well is here, uh, 362. I think about it took us about a week to get there. But 362, the, you, you go up there and drop off, it must drop down about 30, 40 feet. It's a, kind of like a ravine, it goes out a lot like this, like a U turn. And you can hit, you can see, with up there on the ridge, you can see the jobs on the other side. Must be about 30, 40 feet across, maybe 40 feet across. At night, you can see them when the flares go off the ships. So we said, well, we didn't, we didn't bother them and they didn't bother us. That's too far, throw a hand grenade. So, but we would, now, that was two big uh, caves underneath where we were out in light machine guns, out of machine gunner. And I had a gun set up. And we could look over there. We could see the job. They could see us if we looked over. So I was fortunate enough, wise enough, I think, being a hunter on occasion, tell you, I told you, I told the guy, do not look over there. The Japs down there with a rifle looking straight up. I had no more gun out of my mouth because this guy run up there. He looked all like a bing. That's just like, that's all it was to it. Sat him right between the eyes. So I told the rest of them, you see what happened when you don't pay attention? So, but we did, we, we were out, we, I only had a couple of hand grenades. We didn't have any anyway, we sat back and got some hand grenades. And we throw them hand grenades down there. We stopped them Japs from running. See, they had a, later on, come to find out, they had a big old cave underneath there where they were. They come out there. Because when I, when I first got up there and I saw them down there, they were around like you squirrel hunting. They just walk around that rifle sitting on ready. So I didn't, look, I didn't look down there no more. But these other guys, he, when somebody tell you, and they there before you, listen to what you gotta say. Don't you gonna stay there with them? Anyway, uh, after we took three, six, well, we spent the night there. We was there two nights before we moved on. Yeah, the left flank. I suppose we were on the left. We were having trouble moving. Right flank, it wasn't too bad. Cause that's where the airport was on the right hand side, the runways, whatnot. But where we were was thickets and gullies, so we were kind of slow. If you make a mistake, you get shot. I think I, I think we lost almost every man in my company. And I was very fortunate, thank the good Lord, that I didn't get shot. They were shot right next to me. Either that, you know, either that I got wounded. Take us back to the the day when you made the landing and you had to jump in the water. To go ashore. What what thoughts were going through? Well, you? see, we we were in, well, see, we were on LSTs. We were, the, we were the landing force. Well, back when the Big Island, we got off the big ships. Off the big ships, we go aboard LST. Inside of LST, you know, they got the big door to it. Inside, they have oh. LVTs. That's the Amtrak's. They you know, you hire a call about eight Marines in it. We we the landing force. So you know, that's the type that comes out the mouth of the LST into the water. And you don't like to be aboard because the damn thing sinks sometime. Fortunately, I wasn't on one of those, but. So when you were making that first exit to go to shore, what, what was on your mind? What were you thinking? <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell you right in that uh, LST, no, LVT. LVT, the one got Amtrak. Right at uh, LVT, down low, bullets just flying every which way. You could, you could hear them bouncing off the side of it. And our thought was, we didn't know the sand was bad as it was. Uh, we, we was wondering, well, how are we gonna get, what's gonna happen when we get ashore? We, we sit there and we about, I think it's six of us. 
What's going to happen? Get ashore. Because the bullets were ricocheting off the uh, the uh, LVT we was in. And about what? Eight, about eight, ten of them across the line. We was in the first wave of line across the LVT. Uh, to, I think this, I was in the 5th Marine Division, the 3rd Division, I think, and the 2nd and the 3rd Division. Then, then we went over to my right, we to the extreme left. Our job was to cut the island off. And we was in the first ones. Up the deep incline of the sand, once again. He, he dropped us off. He came ashore. We, as I can see it, just as clear. The LBT came ashore. He turned to the side, and we... He, he dropped the ramp. The LVT did not go up up high like this. He, you know how the breakers come in and it's real hard there? He gets there and he turns sideways just a little bit. We jumped and then we had to negotiate that sand hill. We didn't know it at the time, because being there the first wave, and, and that sand was just like sugar. You take a step and slide back too almost. And I tell you, they would kill the hell out of them Marines. Thank the Lord, it, 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 it didn't hit me. But I made it up, up there. I had a car being, you think that damn thing you shoot? Heck no. Got sand in it and it wouldn't even shoot. That uh, makes me, I get angry every time I think about that. But it took the rifle away from me, you know, the old M1. I don't care what you do, it, it, it'll shoot. And it'll load. But that car being, you get a little bit of sand in it, that damn thing wouldn't load. You couldn't get no bullets in it. Just you know, all you can do is use it for a hammer, a sludge, or a bat, or whatever. But invention, I got rid of it. I threw it mine down. I got a hold of me a M1. I got a hold of me a rifle. I think it was about two days later, I had a rifle. Some guy had gotten shot or evacuated. I took his weapon. So then on, I had an M1. We, uh, I tell you, we, we cut that island off that same day. We, we went all the way across. Douglas and Fox Hole, dug in. And we were drawing, we wasn't, we wasn't drawing too much fire from Mount Sabaja for some reason. Uh, I guess they were all concentrating on the landing crafts, you know. And the guys, Well, you know, when you bottle up in a, in a craft, I think it's six or eight of us, eight guys in there, and there's no top on it, and they way, way up here, they shooting down there, you know, they come more. If they shoot it, the pattern, bullet bound ricochet and probably hit someone. But we were very fortunate in that respect. I, I, again, I say the good man up top side, at least in my landing craft. What was your reaction when you heard Japanese had surrendered? I never thought about it, to tell you the truth. Was there a big celebration, or did oh, you no. just go about your day, day doing your daily job? Right, right. At least my unit did, but I know maybe the people back in the States probably had a big part in it. How many years were you in the service? 29. Long I service. got tired and quit. You also saw, I believe, combat in some other conflicts? Me down in Haiti, down in there. Any memories? I, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't see anyone. I saw where they had have been, and you can see a log of over logs that fell down, rotten places where they had dug underneath of it. You could tell where they had slept. And some of the seafood or food of cans they had was still left laying around on the surface. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing I could, but I didn't see no live ones. What, uh, what are you most proud of, of your career with the military? 
myself as a whole, I'm proud of the United States Marine Corps. Gung ho and don't give up. Keep going forward. You might get bogged down, but don't stay bogged down. You gotta keep moving. That's one thing we have to tell us. When I trained recruits, I was a drill instructor for quite over two years. And my uh, thought I would tell my recruits that no such thing is backing up. You may have to back down. No, go to your right, go to your left, don't back up. You already took that, why you try to take it again? So I always told my, you can't go forward, go right, go to the left. But anyway, the addition is go forward. And that's what we're there for. How has military service impacted your life? Well, I tell you, being an old country boy, I come a long way. Uh, All I can say has been outstanding for me. My life in the Marine Corps has been tremendous. And I enjoyed it every month. Some place I've been, I didn't take a like, but that's beside the point. There were other guys had just like me, but we knew we were gonna stay there, so. Rope take me. I also escorted war dead for two years. And I was stationed in Memphis, Tennessee. And I covered from there up north. I think I escorted two up north. But most of all, all dead I escorted was down to going south, down around New Orleans and over in uh, Alabama. What did you do after your service? Well, when, I, when I retired, I had uh, 28, almost 29 years in. And I had made contact with a lot of the police officers there in Buford, small local town. And I tell them I think about uh, retiring. And the police chief said, when you retire, you come here and you have a job. So one day I retired, and the next day I went down, I was a police officer. I was a police officer in Buford, South Carolina until uh, well, I didn't retire, I just resigned because I had to own Vaughn Price down in Florida. But my career of life so far has been, God has blessed me. Had a house full of kids. So you can't run around every place when you got a house full of kids. So kept me tied down. You had, you had also applied for three different positions in the civil service like AFLAC director and such and such, and you, that finally came through in 1968, correct? Right, right. And then you moved, came here and had a house built in Pensacola. Uh, after, after the police, I was on the police force, but I wouldn't get paid anything. I think I'd get paid a dollar or two dollars an hour, and I just couldn't hardly stand that. With, a, with five kids, you know, you have a hard time, so. Next, and I kept listening to see ads, and searching, researching, I seen with people going to, going into civil service, drawing a good salary, different increase. So I applied for it, and I, was, uh, I got a position down in South Carolina. Down in, uh, down, what, did I go to, what, 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 Florida, didn't I? Yeah, that's called Florida. The name of Corey. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, to Corey Field. Corey Field. That's a communication center. And uh, being, that worked out real good for me as being a security guard. So I went back to, I was still a police in Atlanta. So I still pulled the guard dude and the commanding officer. He thought, he thought, well, nothing like a Marine. And, and I couldn't hardly do anything wrong, anything came around. He, he always called on me. So I had a good tour of duty that uh, got promoted. Next thing I know, he's a he's, he's, uh, civil service. I was an eight seven, not eight seven. I don't know what they call it, but anyway, I was an eight. I wound up to be an eight. I was making about $15 an hour, so that's a hell of a lot better than three fifty. Four dollars an hour. And where was that again? At Pensacola, Florida. 
I'm still there too. Are there any last comments that you would like to leave us with? I would say all the young men coming, coming on, stay your course. Don't look back and don't break down. Go forward. You, that's you already taken. You gotta get new territory. You may have to move to your right or to your left, but you gotta continue to keep moving forward. I think that's what I did. I'm a farm boy, and you're plying a good horse. Don't kill him, but Lord, he can make you turns. Yeah, you look over there, you see all that ground you done covered. And you can feel good when you go unhitch and go home at night. And I kind of look at the Marine Corps the same way. Don't back down, be forward, do what you're told to do, and do the best you can. Don't half ass do it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your service, and thank you for taking the time to interview with us today.